I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. You boil things down to the most fundamental truths and then reason up from there. One thing he hasn't done that on is the economy itself because he does what he says is a bad idea and that's reasoning by analogy. If the deficit is not brought under control, America will go bankrupt. A country is no different from an individual. An individual overspends, an individual can go bankrupt and so can a country. Now that might get you to the correct answer more rapidly and more easily than thinking of first principles. But what if the analogy is wrong. And this does not mean starting from demand and supply, which is the go-to model for virtually everything mainstream economists do. I'm Professor Steve Keen, the author of Debunking Economics and the New Economics of Manifesto, and I've just published a new book, Money and Macroeconomics from First Principles for Elon Musk and Other Engineers. Now, the motivation for writing the book was the contrast between Musk, the self-described engineer, and Musk, the political actor. When he's wearing his engineering hat, Musk trumpeted the importance of working from first principles, as he does in this video here. I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we reason by analogy. We're doing this because it's like something else that was done. It's mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But first principles is a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you boil things down to the most fundamental truths and say, okay, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot more mental energy. One thing he hasn't done that on is the economy itself, because when he talks about the economy, he does what he says is a bad idea, and that's reasoning by analogy. Now, that might get you to the correct answer more rapidly and more easily than thinking of first principles. But what if the analogy is wrong? And the only way you can know whether the analogy is wrong is to work from first principles in the first place, which is what I do in this book. I show how to think about the economy like an engineer, not like a mainstream economist, and see how the, both the monetary system and the macroeconomic system actually function. And this does not mean starting from demand and supply, which is the go-to model for virtually everything mainstream economists do. And they do it about the monetary system as well. So here's a typical economist jumping straight to supply and demand curves to attempt to explain the monetary system. Now, since the loanable funds market is a market, you already know it's going to have a demand and a supply curve. Well, my way of thinking, that's like saying, you know, the universe is going to have equants and epicycles. There's no way in which banks use to supply and demand curves to create loans and make bank transfers and so on. They use double entry bookkeeping. And the only program which can show you how this works at the integrated national level is my proprietary software, Ravel. And by the way, if you want to use my proprietary software, Ravel, for economic analysis too, you get it as a free bonus inside my seven week Rebel Economist Challenge, like over 600 people have already done. To learn more, apply at stevekeen.com. And what I want to show first of all is an operation that nobody likes, except possibly the treasurer, and that's taxation. So if you look at this extremely simple vision here, what does taxation do? It takes money out of private bank accounts. For double entry bookkeeping, there has to be a matching entry, and that happens to be on reserves. So when deposits go down, when taxation is taken out of your bank accounts, bank reserves go down as well. What Ravel lets you do is see this model from the point of view of every actor in the system. And this actually has four actors inside it. The banks themselves, which we're showing here, the private sector, which deposits money at the banks, the government, which has the reserves, and the central bank that does the transfers. And when you put the whole thing together, you get this outcome, and you follow through the chain of what happens at the banks, which causes changes at the central bank, which is caused by changes at the treasury, which causes changes at the private sector. You notice that tax increases the net worth of the treasury, and it reduces the net worth of the private sector by precisely the same amount. Well, duh, okay, taxation reduces your net worth. That's not a surprise. But what is a surprise if we replace the word tax with the word surplus? and then take a look at what's going on there. Now, as government runs a surplus, when it taxes more than it spends, so it takes more money out of private bank accounts than it puts into them. And this is regarded by mainstream economists as public sector saving. But let's see what that actually does. And here we go, have the same model, just with surplus taking the place of the word taxation. And now what you can see is the government surplus does increase the net financial worth of the government, but it reduces the net financial work of the private sector by precisely as much. The positive for one is a negative for the other. And what this shows you is that the mainstream economists call public sector savings. You can't add it to private sector savings. It's the exact opposite of what happens at the private sector. Now, economists don't get this because, again, thinking in supply and demand curves, they can't see the accounting that lies behind it. So you get economists making statements like this about being able to add private sector savings and public sector savings together. But there's more to the supply than just individual savers. The supply of loanable 
funds is made up of private savings. That's savings by you and me, but there's also public savings. That's the money that the government has left over after paying for all its expenses. So the supply curve is made up of both private savings and public savings. And that is making a huge mistake because it actually applies at that level is not two things you can add together and get a larger number. It's a conservation law. The negative one is necessarily the positive for the other. And this is what economists miss by working in terms of supply and demand curves. So what you find is reasoning why economists do, trusting economics textbooks leads you astray. You should work from first principles instead. And those in engineering terms are double and triple keeping for the monetary system. Now for the macro economy, first principles, again, does not mean working from supply and demand curves. Again, that is just the wrong foundation for analyzing a capitalist economy. In fact, in this book, I show something quite remarkable. You can build a model of the macro economy by working from strictly true macroeconomic definitions. If I take the employment rate, which is the ratio of people with a job to the population, the wages share of GDP, which is one of the three social classes in the model, workers, capitalists, and bankers, that gives me the distribution of income. The level of private debt, not public, private debt compared to GDP, which tells you how financialized the economy is, and the government deficit relative to GDP, telling you how much government money is being created, but that's what a so-called deficit actually does, you end up with these four verbal statements, which give you quite a complex model as a result. So the employment rate will rise if employment grows faster than population. That's simply putting in dynamic terms the definition that the employment rate is the ratio of those people with a job to the population. The wages share of GDP will rise if wages grow faster than GDP. The private debt ratio will rise if debt grows faster than GDP. And the government deficit ratio will rise if the deficit grows faster than GDP. Now, they're all just basically factual statements put in dynamic terms. But if you put those into a model, a dynamic non-equilibrium model, what you get is not equilibrium, which is what the neoclassicals always come back to fantasizing about, but cycles and permanent cycles. So here's a model of those four sectors put together. I've run 100 years into the simulation, and you will see these complex cycles continue indefinitely. This is the sort of thing that physicists and engineers are fairly comfortable with. Economists fantasize that the economy heads towards equilibrium. They make ludicrous so-called simplifying assumptions to eliminate the possibility of these cycles. This is what the real world is like. This is what we should be modeling. Those are probably the two main components of my new book, but other elements turn up as well, particularly including the importance of credit in the financial system. So again, neoclassical economists ignore credit on the basis of an assumption that credit simply transfers spending power from one group to another. But when you take a look at the data and say what's actually going on here, then you see a dramatic role for credit in the overall economy. In fact, the looking at the credit as a percentage of GDP and the unemployment rate, they're virtually opposite to each other. According to economic theory, there should be no correlation. According to the data, there's an overwhelming correlation. Credit causes the cycles in capitalism. A conventional economists ignore it. I show why it's so important. There's also another major issue that economists omit from their thinking. And amazingly, from somebody who's of an engineering point of view, it's energy. They leave energy out of their models of production. I've shown how you can include energy, and you have to, because when you take a look at the data, and this is looking at the data again in my Ravel software, the correlation between energy and gross world product, which is the sum of all gross domestic products, is ridiculously tight. But of course, they're both increasing. So that's partly where the correlation comes from. But if I look at the change in gross world product and the change in energy, the correlation is still extremely high, 0.88. And this basically tells you that to a first approximation, what the GDP actually is, is energy turned into useful work. Now, that should be part of what economists learn, They can, but they never do. They Again, they don't work from first principles. This is working from first principles of thermodynamics. My little phrase about this is, labor without energy is a corpse, capital without energy is a sculpture. You must have energy's inputs to both, otherwise you can't produce output. This is ignored by the mainstream. I show how important it is in this book. And there's many other topics that I cover there. Those are probably the most important ones, but it's vital that engineers with their first principles way of thinking take over from economists and this book shows how that can be done so get your copy through amazon at the moment it's being distributed only as a kindle but we hope to be releasing 
a, a hard copy in the next week or two. Hit number one for a while on both macro and micro on Kindle. Let's get it back up there again because we need this to replace the nonsense thinking that economists do about the economy, which has led us into the traps they're now trying to lead us out of. And to finish with a quote from another famous physicist, you don't solve problems by using the same reasoning that got you into them. You have to find a different way to reason. Let's follow Albert Einstein and other great physicists getting rid of neoclassical economics, thinking about the economy from first principles, the way an engineer does, the way a physicist does, the way Elon Musk used to think about rockets, but he's never thought that way about the economy. It's about time he did tell him. Like many other truth seekers, I want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks. You'll love my new seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to stevecane.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like-minded people. So again, like many others, go to stevecane.com to apply as well for the seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.